Hello. My first video introduced this channel with the topic, What Makes a Good Treatment Center? And this is the promised follow-up to that video, What Makes a Bad Treatment Center? First off, I want to say that any treatment is a good thing. If an addict has made the choice to get clean and acknowledge they need help, the future for this person is very bright and they should feel good about it. No matter how bad their current situation, homeless, unemployed, lost custody of their children, legal issues, health issues, I've seen people turn it around so thoroughly that you wouldn't recognize them. It's like a social transformation, the type you'd only expect in movies. A bet? <laughs> in just a few months, they could be getting their 90-day chip with their own apartment, working a good job, enrolled in school, getting it, just getting it in, living their best life. You'd be amazed how quickly people can change once they're clean. If you have a loved one who's really in a bad way or you yourself are in some dire straits, take heart. No, it's not a fun place to be at, and that's why I started this video with the positive outcome to motivate people about the process. A common saying in the recovery community is, no one just wakes up and decides, I think I'm going to go to treatment today. True, things have to be sufficiently bad to motivate someone to check themselves into the inpatient. But it's not true that you have to hit rock bottom before making a change. In fact, the people who decided on their own that they need to get help are regularly applauded in treatment for seeing the writing on the wall and deciding to do something about it sooner rather than later. The potential offered by a stay in treatment is huge, so it's important to choose a good program. The things that make a bad treatment center are either factors on the resident side or the staff side. As I touched on briefly, the biggest thing that can wreck a treatment program is on the resident side. Everything from bad attitudes and negative influence to bringing drugs and paraphernalia into the house, causing relapse and even overdose, are liabilities of having bad clients in the house. It's on the management and intake staff to mitigate these risks by vetting prospective clients thoroughly. And after that, it's up to clinical and support staff to watch for signs of trouble before they turn into a crisis. I talked about how no one just wakes up thinking it'd be a good day to go to rehab. So a lot of people make the decision when they get booked into jail. This can be a good crossroads that forces people to take a serious look at their addiction problems, but it can also just mean a quick way to get out of jail. Staff need to do everything they can to make sure a person is serious about treatment before furloughing them out of jail. These are often the ones to sneak drugs into the house. It happened in an inpatient treatment center I was staying at. The vigil on exactly this type of furlough snuck in some heroin and syringes and used in their room. They got their roommate caught up as well. They waited till after programming was over for the day so they wouldn't get caught being high, and both of them ended up ODing. Fortunately, treatment centers usually have a, it's called a tech, doing hourly walkthroughs, kind of like an orderly doing rounds, and they were able to call 911 or both of them might have died. Needless to say, a treatment center with drugs in the house is a bad place for people trying to get clean. It's an unsafe environment for everybody, and is the biggest thing that can ruin a treatment program. Another thing that makes a bad treatment program is too short a duration. Look forward to a full template of what an effective recovery plan looks like in the near future. For now, just take it from me that the old industry standard 28-day program is not sufficient. It's practically pointless. It won't even come close to cutting it. Most serious treatment centers offer a 90-day stay inpatient, and that's where I just completed, and that's what I recommend. This channel is intended for the treatment professionals as much as it is for addicts. So if that's you, take this video as some suggestions to improve your program. And the thing to try to avoid is trite, boring content, like boring recovery videos, akin to lame training videos you'd see when you're starting a job. Thank God as a salad bar, but a lot of people who get hungry, it was perfect. Too perfect. And I know this is going to be uh, to the disappointment and even shock of many treatment professionals, but I have to say I don't care much for TED Talks. Though some are good. A bad treatment center may have consistency issues. Treating one person one way and then treating someone else in a similar situation in a different way. No trying to justify it by saying, well, it's an individualized program, or it's a case-to-case -case basis, will work. People will realize if they are getting treated differently. 
Also, along the same lines, staff members just automatically going along with whatever another staff member says is not a good precedent to set. I understand the desire to present a united front, but if you sacrifice integrity in order to say, for instance, make a junior level employee feel like staff always has each other's back, uh, the result is clients will know not to take you seriously. The last thing I want to point out when it comes to a bad treatment center is the lack of spirituality. There's a reason that every major recovery plan includes spirituality as a cornerstone of the program. 10 or 15 years ago, there was no treatment program not based on the 12 steps. Now in an effort to try to avoid having to adopt spiritual principles, new and creative, shall we say, models of addiction have popped up, such as the uh, harm reduction model or the health realization model, as opposed to the standard disease model, which I believe is the truth. But it requires faith, because after all, it is a spiritual disease. And not everyone can wrap their head around that. I understand the temptation to want to downplay the necessity of spirituality and recovery, to avoid putting off atheists, but for reasons I will go over more thoroughly in another video, that dog just won't hunt. There's a chapter to the agnostic in the big book of AA. There is no chapter to the atheist. Some people say their higher power is the chair, and as a fellow alcoholic, it's not necessarily your responsibility to correct them, but as a sort of authority figure in the recovery process, you're obligated to be frank and honest, even if it will be upsetting. And you can't turn your will and your life over to the care of a chair. This is just the tip of the iceberg of problems intrinsic to atheist materialist naturalism when it comes to recovery. Okay, that'll do it for episode three. There'll be a new episode every week. I'm going to be shooting for Sunday mornings. The goal is going to be to have everything finished up Saturday night so I can have everything uploaded and ready to go so I don't have to do any work on the Lord's Day. Please like and share this video to help reach those who might need it. I'll see you next time.